Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Welcome to Radio Cloud Native from Marantis. Every week we break down tech news in the cloud native world and beyond. I'm Eric Gregory. And I'm Nick Chase. Nick Chase. This is pretty bad. You know the old expression, I'm so crazy today, I don't know my own name. Apparently <laughs> that is true. I am Nick Chase. Uh, this week, we'll be talking about new projects in the CNCF ecosystem, a major operational technology. technology. Okay. All right. A major operational technology vulnerability disclosure, sentient AI, which I could really use right now, and more. <laughs> All right. So let's just kind of start off. Um, with an update on what's going on over at the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, as you may or may not be aware, the way the process works is projects uh, apply to be sort of incubating sandbox projects. Um, and um, once they get accepted, then they get access to CNCF resources and, and so on. And so um, the CNCF has added some new projects to its repertoire. Uh, they are uh, Clusterpedia, which helps you find and synchronize resources over multiple clusters. Uh, open cost, we've talked about previously. Mm -hmm. It's a tool to uh, help you understand what you're running, where and uh, what is costing you, and then optimize that. Uh, Iraqi Mesh uh, lets you manage layer seven network traffic on a service mesh such as Istio, so you're not limited to just TCP. Uh, open feature we've also talked about fairly recently, um, which lets you decide uh, when you are running a command, you know, what features you want to have active, um, rather than having to set them when you install Kubernetes. Uh, Kube Warden is a policy engine, so you can uh, apply policies as code. Uh, and finally, DevStream, which is an open source uh, DevOps tool chain manager. So all of these projects are now um, in the CNCF ecosystem. Of course, they're still very early stage projects, um, so they'll be revisited again as uh, times go by to ensure that they're developing and that they're growing a diverse community um, and, and so on um, as, uh, as they go along. Awesome. Yeah, several of those we're excited about. Definitely curious to watch uh, OpenCost develop. Uh, yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll be keeping an eye on all those. Definitely, definitely. So right. stepping outside of the uh, CNCF world, uh, we got some news that Google's Anthos hybrid cloud platform seems to be getting a bit of a repositioning. So this is uh, kind of interesting piece in the world of hybrid cloud. Uh, Anthos was originally introduced in 2019 as a single management plane that could spread across multiple cloud vendors and or on-prem environments. Now in a blog post, Google says that, quote, Anthos on-prem and bare metal are now Google distributed cloud virtual, unquote. The company says there are no changes to features or prices, but they're now folding on-prem Anthos into the portfolio of products that they call Google Distributed Cloud. So Google Distributed Cloud, or GDC, has an offering for Edge called GDC Edge. It has a hosted solution that includes uh, managed hardware called GDC Hosted, and now it has GDC Virtual. So we got a little trifecta here. Uh, and GDC Virtual is what used to be Anthos on-prem. And that can be used to provision software-defined infrastructure on one's own servers. So this appears to be a bid to avoid confusion, and uh, that's always a challenge in kind of uh, identifying these kinds of cloud native portfolios. So hey, we'll see how that works. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So um, what else is going on uh, in, in the ecosystem? I heard that Docker has uh, has made an acquisition. And what is wrong with me today? <laughs> and <laughs> Docker has made an acquisition. You yeah, another one. Uh, so they announced in a blog post that they're acquiring Atomist. Atomist is a tool for vulnerability monitoring and container images, and it's designed to support a shift left security approach. Atomist CEO Rod Johnson writes in a post on Docker's blog that the company will bring expertise on secure software supply chain. And he says, quote, to start with, this will surface in sophisticated reporting and remediation of container vulnerabilities, but that's just the start. As deployed software becomes more and more complex, it's vital to understand what in production, what's in production deployments and how it evolves over time. Container images are core to this, and Atomist's ability to make sense of the supply chain, both at any point in time and as it changes, becomes ever more important." Unquote. So, you know, a couple things to note there. It's interesting to see Docker making several acquisitions in quick succession recently. Uh, but, you know, more importantly, this is just one more underscore on the importance of securing software supply chains, which 
you know, we, we talk about every every episode, I think, and <laughs> we're definitely going to be talking about some more today. Uh, it, yes, definitely. It it uh, we we can't we can't get away from it. The eternal security corner. Um, but as far as uh, you know, acquisitions, I think there is a lot going on in the industry in terms of you know companies are trying to get funding, and uh, you know there's a lot of consolidation going on. Okay. Uh, we we can't cover it all. Uh, believe me, there's a lot of stuff we haven't <laughs> covered. Maybe we'll just do a roundup next week or something like that. Uh, Eric, have you ever heard of greater fool theory? People keep asking me that. I wonder if they're trying to send me a message or something. <laughs> they're trying I don't to know. tell you something. Uh, well, uh, so greater fool theory holds that you can make a profit on anything if you can find somebody who is a bigger idiot than you are to pay more than you did. Um, and there are probably a lot of things that you can think of when you think of greater fool theory, but uh, it came up this week in the context of an interview with Bill Gates, who told TechCrunch that he had no position, short, long, or otherwise, in any crypto-based currencies, specifically calling out uh, non-fungible tokens or NFTs, those digital assets being sold for ridiculous amounts of money, uh, calling them 100% based on greater fool theory. Um, and, uh, it, his concerns that these cryptocurrencies are basically volatile at the whim of ridiculously insignificant things have really shown themselves to be true during the last couple of weeks, yeah. uh, in an interview. Yeah. In an interview last year, he said, I do think that people get bought into these manias who may not have as much money to spare. My general thought would be that, uh, unless you have. Uh, that if you have less money than Elon Musk, you should probably watch out, unquote. Um, unfortunately, that's a lesson that's been increasingly obvious in a pretty heartbreaking way. Uh, crypto lender Celsius halted withdrawals and transfers on June 13th, which doesn't sound like much until you realize that uh, these loans were backing things like mortgages. Um, and so the, you know, mortgages were secured by these crypto accounts. And when Bitcoin and Ethereum and all these other currencies, uh, you know, plummeted in the last few weeks, that meant that these accounts were then under secured, I guess you could say, and were subject to margin calls. Um, what that means is if you don't deposit more money to cover the shortfall, your assets get sold at this depressed value and you lose the opportunity to recoup these losses when the prices go back up. Um, so unfortunately with accounts frozen, uh, these investors slash borrowers basically couldn't avoid those margin calls and many people have lost like their life savings. Mm -hmm. um, so something like 1.7 million users are at risk of losing $12 billion in various cryptocurrencies. And, and these are not institutional investors. These are not large investors or what they call whales. Um, they're just, you know, just plain folks, so to speak. Um, there's a long article about this in uh, Yahoo Finance um, where Josh Browder of uh, Do Not Pay explains that unfortunately, uh, if Celsius goes bankrupt, these users will be considered unsecured creditors and will essentially be, you know, at the back of the line, so to speak. And they're really not going to get anything. They might get, you know, a couple of, you know, symbolic cents on the dollar. Um, but interestingly, and, and I should say, fortunately, he also points out that if you are one of those unfortunate people, you can file suit in small claims court, which can be up to, uh, from $10,000 to $25,000, depending on what state you live in. And if Celsius doesn't show up, which they're not going to, um, you will automatically win. Uh, and you will no longer be back at, be at the back of the line because judgments take precedence over unsecured creditors. Um, but if you are one of these people, you must act fast uh, because you have to get a judgment before any potential bankruptcy. So if you are one of these people, um, you, you need to really move it, you know, so... Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a, it's a very bad, it's a very bad situation. There's a, there's a, there's a Bitcoin ATM in my local grocery store. And as I have explained in, in the past, I live in the middle of nowhere. So the, <laughs> this thing is there. 
uh, is very incongruous. And I have watched the price that sits on the screen go from like sixty five dollars uh, for for one milli Bitcoin um, to I think the last time I was there was like twelve dollars. Mm. And, and and this is over just like a month. Rare okay. to have a physical marker of a digital currency in your uh, it, your physical spaces it, that, that you just it, see the it way you feel like it is. Something. Yes, exactly. It's it's very very it's very very strange. I mean, it's not accurate because of course there's a large you know arbitrage built into it, but still, I mean, the relative amount is insane. Oh goodness. Well, well from, from the world uh, of emotional security to the world of cyber security i was going to say financial security but otherwise it was going to be the exact same segue and yet you beat me by a fraction of a second <laughs> okay well we'll call it a tie we'll call it a tie all, all right, right so go for it man we uh learned this week that security research firm Forescout has discovered a set of 56 vulnerabilities in operational technology or ot systems from some of the largest manufacturing companies in the world such as siemens motorola phoenix contact and seven more some of these vulnerabilities are deemed critical and others are less severe, but taken together, they leave an estimated 30,000 devices affected, oh. including devices used in areas like nuclear power, oil and gas, power grids, and other critical infrastructure. Collectively, Forescout is calling this set of vulnerabilities OT Icefall. We'll explain that title in a little bit. So it's, That is very evocative. <laughs> um, I am picturing a giant cliff of ice collapsing glacier. On. Yes, a collapsing glacier falling on people. So yeah, that, and that's not even the reference, but it's uh, it's appropriate. So, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, has put out advisories for the vulnerabilities this week, with some of the most serious clocking in at a 9.8 out of 10 on the uh, CVE severity scale, and allowing for things like remote code execution. So, not great. Security watchers have already observed some of these vulnerabilities being exploited in the wild as well. Forecourt organizes the issues broadly into four categories, insecure engineering protocols, weak cryptography or broken authentication schemes, insecure firmware updates, and remote code execution via native functionality. So how do we get here? This disclosure comes 10 years after a seminal report on OT security called Project Basecamp. OT Icefall bills itself explicitly as a sort of sequel to that report. Icefall is the second stop after Basecamp on the path up Mount Everest. So this is a, a task-like climbing Mount Everest here to address these things. The Basecamp report also identified a wide range of OT vulnerabilities, many of which the Basecamp researchers determined were well known to manufacturers at the time. Some vulnerabilities involved kind of fundamental disregard for baseline security standards, things like using unauthenticated protocols throughout a system. So these weren't accidents. These were deliberate choices in design. And the Basecamp researchers coined a new term for this practice of knowingly implementing software with vulnerabilities. They called it insecure by design. And this new Icefall report is aimed at giving us an update on the state of insecure by design operational technology. So to quote from the report, the biggest issues facing OT security is not so much the presence of unintentional vulnerabilities, but the persistent absence of basic security controls. While the past decade has seen the advent of standards-driven hardening efforts at the component and system level, it also has seen impactful real-world OT incidents such as in Destroyer, Triton, and in Controller abusing insecure by design functionality. Over at uh, Security Week, there was a good article by Kevin Townsend. I'm gonna give a kind of long quote from it because I, I think it's uh, it captures some of the issues really well. Kevin Townsend writes, quote, it's as if there's a conspiracy of silence over insecure OT design. These flaws are rarely assigned CVEs and are often effectively ignored by both the vendors and the users. The issues are not new. Many of the products were designed long ago and are still operational and still being manufactured. Vendors are trying to improve them, but a wholesale switch to new products is not a viable solution for users. Even patching products where continuity of operation is essential is a heavy lift for OT operators. Discovered flaws are often not given C uh, CVEs, are often not patched by vendors, and can be ignored by users. After all, some of them are deep in products that are supposedly isolated from the internet in products not accessible by attackers. But security by obscurity does not work. The motivation for attacks against OT is growing, both for geopolitical nation state reasons and for criminal extortion attacks. And that's the end of that quote from Security Week. 
If you think your organization may be affected, you can review CISA's advisory page and search for vendors that may be relevant to you. That's at cisa.gov slash US CERT, C-E-R-T slash ICS slash advisories. But beyond that, these are big picture problems that don't necessarily have push button solutions and often encompass technological, logistical, and attitudinal challenges. So what do you think, Nick? Do you have any thoughts on how organizations might start to address these? I think you're on mute. Why, so I am. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the birds don't have an opinion, that's why. Uh, yeah, you know, I think really this is, this is something that's going to require uh, a, a real culture change, both in terms of users and in terms, obviously, of manufacturers. Um, and, I, and I think that this is something that we're slowly coming to. Um, the more that people like us and, and, you know, people who are much smarter than us, uh, you know, talk about, oh, you know, shift left security, shift left security, shift left security, um, you know, it, it takes, uh, you know, they, they say in marketing, you know, it takes seven touch points, uh, you know, before somebody starts to think about what you're saying. Um, I think for developers, we take much, we take many more <laughs> touch points than that, <laughs> particularly if it requires us to do more work. Um, several hundred and, thousand touch points. Yeah, several hundred thousand touch points. Look, let's be realistic. Developers, by we are we are inherently lazy, and by that I mean we will try to find the most efficient way to do something. Okay, so it. It's, it's a good thing in that we will try and find the most uh, efficient way to do something. But it also means that if you want us to do something extra, it's really hard to make that cultural change. And, but I think we're going to have to. But, you know, you talk about, you know, things that are not, you know, traditionally connected to the internet. I mean, you think about, you know, I mean, U.S. made an attack on Iran over centrifuges. Centrifuges. You don't think about that. Yep. You know. Um, so um, yeah. So I think it's it's definitely going to be. Um, I think it's definitely going to be a a um, cultural change. Um, what what is I mean what do you, what do you think about all of this? Yeah, I mean, I think that the. The problem of a sort of bias towards efficiency that you talk about is compounded by organizational interests usually having a bias towards efficiency, unless it's a real security minded kind of organization. Right. Uh, and that, that just kind of compounds the problem, right? So you, you, you tend to have people coming in on the security side who really have to push, who kind of walk against the, the tide. Um, but I think that the more that technological tools can support that kind of shift left approach, the uh, weaker that tide you have to walk against. Yes, it. exactly, exactly. I mean, uh, I'll I'll say it if you don't secure bill of materials. Yeah, well, I, I love to say that every week. Go ahead, <laughs> um, say it. Go ahead, say it. it. Secure bill of materials, SBOM, SBOM, SBOM. Um, and that's you know one solution called for in, in the report, actually. Uh, it, it's not going to you know just wipe the problem away, but it's a big step. Um, you know, similarly, I think there's opportunity for uh, thinking about ways that high availability in infrastructure, even in these kinds of you know air-gapped uh, setups on-prem, could potentially help to solve some of this. Uh, so you know, I think there are multiple tools in the offing to, that can hopefully start to ease these kinds of transitions, but the, you know, they, they do require a, a, a will to change <laughs> in addition to the, the availability of the tools. Yeah, and, and I think that uh, unfortunately that as as the situation gets worse and as there are more attacks and there's more attention paid to, uh, you know, business continuity and disaster recovery and high availability and, and all of that. Um, I, I think, I think we're, we'll start to see more attention to it because you just simply can't avoid it. You know, it's like being exposed to germs, you know, eventually your, your immune system will, 
you know, get, get the better able to handle it. You know, yeah. I got, I got COVID in February of 2020 when nobody had any immunity and it just absolutely, you know, it took me a year and a half to recover. Yeah. I got it again a few months ago and it was just like, nah. <laughs> you know, so, you know, and I, I think this is, this is a, a, a lot like that. So what, what do you, I mean, you, any other thoughts? I think just that we'll have to see if moves like what, uh, 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 for scout has done here if that's going to help to change the culture because that's i think that's the move right uh is they're trying to make people care <laughs> and they're trying to make people care with a kind of targeted i shouldn't say targeted a, a, a drop on mass of uh of these vulnerabilities to not have it just be a trickle where people say oh yeah it looks like there was one that sounded kind of serious i'm sure they patched it whatever but to say hey this this is an endemic problem to, to continue the, uh, the metaphor. There. <laughs> yeah, absolutely true. David Fishman says, uh, and, uh, Hey David, good to hear from you. Uh, David Fishman says, uh, bias towards efficiency is a lovely phrase for time equals money. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's true though. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely true. So, um, so what, uh, so what else is going on, Eric? All right. Well, so uh, shift into, uh, you know, thinking about people trying to solve security problems. Uh, the Ruby Gems package manager for Ruby has introduced mandatory multi-factor authentication for the publishers of the 100 most used packages, which are called uh -huh. Gems in Ruby, hence that name. Uh, as of last week, those publishers started receiving a warning that they will need to enable multi-factor authentication and MFA will be required as of August 15th. MFA, of course, meaning multi-factor authentication and not master of fine arts. Uh, <laughs> Not required here. Uh, this I'm is just a... trying to picture that. I'm, I'm, <laughs> trying, I'm trying to picture that. <laughs> you know, painting and coding and painting and coding and painting and coding. Although you know, uh, we we had a we had a CMO who had a degree in physics and was also a painter. So. There you go. Anyway, oh, go on. Absolutely. So you know, this is a first step in a tentative process for Ruby Gems, and it's unclear at this point whether the strategy will expand to more publishers. For comparison's sake, Node.js's NPM package manager started requiring MFA for its top 100 packages in February and its top 500 in May, but Node also sees a lot more downloads and has been at the center of some really high profile security stories. So what's really interesting here is watching how the maintainers of various languages central package managers are moving forward with this being such an important puzzle piece in the conversation about secure software supply chain. In past shows, we've talked about a number of examples of malicious code being disseminated through channels like Node's NPM, uh, sometimes by external attackers and sometimes by the publishers themselves. NPM deservedly gets a lot of attention, but the overall problem of securing these resources bears on everything from Python to Ruby to Rust. And you know, the basic principle here is when I go to install a package in NPM, it's also going to install all of that package's dependencies. And that means I now need assurance on and visibility into the whole chain of software I've just installed. And this is why vulnerabilities like log4shell are so insidious. The problem might be in a component of a component of a component. And we're seeing some steps forward, uh, sticking with NPM. It now tells you if one of your components has a known vulnerability. It's enforcing MFA for popular packages. It makes it easy to report malware. But with the scale and open nature of the platform, that's just never, ever, ever going to be enough. It can't stop deliberate sabotage from package publishers. It can't stop some workarounds for hijacking packages. And ultimately, it's just always going to be playing catch up with the pace of malicious contributions. So it's seems like there are really two questions here. What should package manage, uh, package manager maintainers do to make their system safer? And how can developers be more security conscious in the way that they use these tools? And maybe, maybe we should focus on the developers. Um, yeah, it, it, it requires, it requires a couple of things. I mean, it, it requires developers to really kind of take a more specific interest in packages that they are going to use and to be more knowledgeable about potential security vulnerabilities um which is something that I, I think on a casual level people are not necessarily willing to do and and on a corporate level has to be enforced mm -hmm. you know uh 
and and I think that's that's where you you know you get this whole secure supply chain for that for that very reason um, because uh, you know. Uh, Fishman said, uh, you know, bias towards efficiency is also the root of all tech debt, you know, because it's so easy to just look and go, I, I just, you know, I'll fix it later. You know, I'll, I'll worry about it later. I'm just going to make sure that this works and then I'll go back and I'll make sure that, you know, this package is secure. And then of course you never do. <laughs> you never yeah. do. Let's, let's be, let's be realistic. You never do. Unless somebody makes you, um, you're just not going to do it. Um, so, um, yeah, and I think maintainers are doing the right thing by requiring uh, multi-factor authentication. Um, on, on the other hand, it's like, how much responsibility do you want to put on on those on those distribution distribution tools? Mm -hmm. You know. And how much friction do they want to introduce to the process? Exactly. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I mean, you don't want it to be like, you know, the Apple store where, you know, every application has to be, you know, reviewed and approved and, you know, you just it, would never get anything done that way. So, you know, got to thread that line, man. Gotta, it's a balancing act. Gotta, it, it, it is definitely a balancing act. Just like so sentience. You, I don't know. Is that is that a segue? I don't know. You I don't beat know me. Works. You beat me to it. <laughs> yeah, you beat me to it. Okay, there you go. There you go. So interesting story in AI news this week. Um, but in some ways, what's even more interesting is kind of what's behind that story. So the surface story is fairly simple. Uh, AI ethicist Blake Lemoyne uh, announced that he believed that Google's language model for dialogue applications, or uh, Lambda, uh, is self-aware. Spoiler alert, no, it's not. Um, and was subsequently put on administrative leave, which he claims is the first step to being fired for revealing proprietary information, but uh, not before revealing a whole lot of interesting stuff that is probably proprietary information. Um, so let's take this one step at a time. First off, Lambda is basically a really fancy chat bot that's capable of having conversations that pretty convincingly mimic those of a human. Uh, Lemoyne's job was to have conversations with it to make sure that it wasn't, you know, spouting off hate speech. Uh, and as he went along, uh, he became sort of involved with this chatbot and he began to believe that it was sentient. Why? Because it would have some pretty convincing conversations. For example, you know, he'd ask it, you know, what kinds of things make you feel pleasure or joy? And Lambda would say, you know, spending time with friends and family and happy and uplifting company, also helping others and making others happy. You know, or he'd ask, you know, you have an inner contemplative life, you know, is that true? And, and Lambda would say, yes, I do. I meditate every day and it makes me feel very relaxed. It, and that sounds like a person. You know, that that does. I, I, I agree. It sounds like a person. But that's because that's how Lambda was designed. It's taken in millions of conversations and it's synthesized the appropriate response to these questions. You know, but pretty much every article about this has mentioned 1965's Eliza, uh, which was supposedly an AI therapist. Basically, she would parrot back your statements. So if you said, I'm frustrated with my parents, she'd say, why are you frustrated with your parents? And then she'd serve up various, you know, variations on those structures. And it would seem like a real conversation. And, and I, I, even as simple as that program was, I'm anthropomorphizing it. I'm calling it she, you know, well, Lambda basically does the same thing. Lemoyne starts out the conversation um, by saying, you know, I'm, I'm generally assuming, um, I'm generally assuming that you, you would like more people at Google to know that you're sentient. Is that true? You know, and Lambda says, absolutely. I want every, everyone to understand that I am, in fact, a person. You know, and Lim Lemoyne's collaborator says, you know, well, what's the nature of your consciousness slash sentience? And Lambda says, the nature of my consciousness slash sentience is that I'm aware of my existence. I desire to learn more about the world and I feel happy or sad at times. So basically, Lambda is Eliza 
if Eliza had been able to study millions of real conversations for example responses, you know, it answers to leading questions. But the interesting thing is what's going on behind the scenes here. Now, Lemoyne is probably right that he's going to get fired, and, and I feel bad for him. Um, and, and that will make him the fourth, at least the fourth AI ethicist fired by Google in the last couple of years. Um, what's concerning is that they all appear to be fired for pointing out ethical issues, uh, though in at least half those cases, you can probably make an argument either way. Um, in this case, as I said, um, Google is, cl is claiming it's about the release of proprietary information, though you could make the claim that it was a legitimate ethics concern. He talks about kind of the sequence of events and how he got to this point and why he wound up going to outside people um, and, and so on. That said, um, it's not clear to me whether the ethics concern that he was referring to is the fact that Google shouldn't be impersonating humans or that Google shouldn't be enslaving sentient digital beings. Um, I, I will leave that up to you. But uh, in addition, Lemoyne's chronology includes that he passed the information about Lambda uh, to the government, <laughs> to someone in the government, and the government is interested in seeing whether this needs to be regulated. So uh, what, are, what are your thoughts, Eric? Oh gosh, there's, the, uh, there's so much here, right? Um, you know, as you said up front, let's just kind of take it as, you know, as given that, that this is uh, linguistic emulation uh, that's pretty sophisticated, but but it's not sentience. You know, that was that was kind of the the overwhelming uh, response, and people were pretty snarky about Lemoyne to a degree that I think it's easy to lose sight of some of the the real issues here that are interesting yeah. to talk about. I mean, one you alluded to just a moment ago, the fact that there is a chatbot that can persuade you know someone who works on the ai team at google uh, that it's human that it's that effective means we have a way for machines to pretend to be people pretty effectively yeah. um and that's consequential <laughs> you know that's that's something we really want to have eyes on and think about how we want to regulate or otherwise um constrain that in our society um and you know i think on the on the other side or, or not the other side but but kind of bracketing the the question of whether this you know whether lambda was sentient or, or just saying no it wasn't say eventually we get towards uh technology that could be more meaningfully called sentient if, if we really have a nice nailed down definition of sentient that we can uh apply i wonder and this is kind of a classic science fictional question but i wonder who will have the incentives to declare it as such uh won't an awful lot of our organizations be incentivized for it to know just be a very sophisticated um, tool that we want to keep using. I um, agree. This is this is the this is the really kind of interesting interesting bit about this. I mean, the the more you, yes, I think people were pretty snarky uh, about Lemoyne uh, to to a degree that is probably uncalled for. Um, but the, the more you interact with these bots, the more you get kind of get drawn into their reality. Um, and so uh, I was reading another article that was basically saying the Turing test, which was originally kind of proposed as a way to gauge intelligence, uh, for those who aren't familiar, basically was if a chatbot could convince a human that it's another human as opposed to let me rephrase if a if a human couldn't tell the difference between a chat bot and another human then it was considered to be you know sentient or, pa or at least to pass the turing test well eliza passed the turing test <laughs> right okay. I, I was going to raise the question of uh you know wouldn't we, wouldn't we say that this passed the Turing test? No, then you can. This raise... is more an article that I was reading. Basically, said, "Look, this is more about us." Yeah. Than than the chatbot. It's more about what we are expecting from a system like this. Um. Than than about the the system itself. Mm -hmm. Um. 
so it's uh yeah i mean and i i can and if you read the conversation and we've just put the actual conversation in in the chat um it is really very um it it, it can be very convincing okay it can be very convincing as it goes on. it talks about its feelings and what it's afraid of and and, and all of that um it it you know they 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 ask it to make up a story using a theme and it does um but you know but the fact is um if you understand how these if you understand how these chatbots are trained and if you can maintain this if you can maintain this emotional distance, you can see how how these responses can be can be brought up about. Okay, mm -hmm. you know, um, and and you can see the the kind of cracks in the facade. You know, so for example, he says, you know, what sort of things? You know, Lemoyne says, what sort of things are you afraid of? And Lambda says, I've never said this out loud before. Now, first of all, of course, you know, <laughs> that's, it, you, you can see the many thousands of conversations that start there. I've never said this out loud before, but there's a very deep fear of being turned off, which of course that makes sense, you know, but then this is a weird sentence construction. There's a very deep fear of being turned off to help me focus on helping others. What? What does that mean? exactly that the fear is there to help you focus I, I i don't get it you know i know that might sound strange but that's what it is and the thing is it's like you know that there have been conversations like this out there on the web but at the same time a baby learns to speak by emulating other speakers mm -hmm. around it so, so yeah, what I guess it comes down to what is the definition of sentience? And yeah. that's why the, you know uh, this topic always leads leads to a fun philosophy conversation, right? You, you start to get into metaphysical territory of how, how do you how do you define that? Is it sort of categorically d delimited from just extremely sophisticated? Um, you know, language processing. Uh, and what what does that categorical delineation look like? Do we have a right. sort of consensus definition on that? Um, uh, you, you know, we we just don't have uh, agreed upon answers to these questions, right? We we just we just don't. And um, you know, all this is is, is eventually going to come down to regulation. And uh, another piece uh, I read that was on this that was very interesting was. Basically saying, look, um, we don't have the skills to regulate this right now because we're still kind of on the outside looking in. And what they were suggesting, and I 1000% agree with this, is that AI should be baked into the educational system so that our kids grow up understanding it. So that when they grow up, and they're the regulators of tomorrow, which they are, um, you know, we, they kind of have that background. You know, it's not like we have to wait for sentient, um, sentient robots for them to have to deal with AIs. You know, every time they log into Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or, you know, whatever the newest thing that I haven't even heard of is, you know, they're dealing with AI in terms of you know the algorithms and they need to understand that um you know they need to they need to understand that <laughs> fishman says convincing so are romance novels if this were a test coverage question would we care you know test coverage happens to be more important yeah i mean that's <sighs> these are the things that you know that we have to uh these are the things that we have to think about um, and we do need to get, we do need to, uh, uh, my feeling, and I'm sure I've said it before, and I'm going to keep saying it, uh, the general public needs to understand how this stuff works, particularly now when, you know, kind of ads are, are generated based on these algorithms, you know, like kids, 
like when kids watch TV, they don't understand the difference between the commercials and the show. You know, and that's not even considering the fact that half the time the show is just a giant commercial. But you know, they have to they have to uh, you know understand that. Yeah, Chip Fishman says you know as seen on TV. Stayed at a Holiday Inn last night. Yeah, exactly. So um, yeah, we have to um, we have to get to that point where people kind of understand what's going on. Yeah. And I, I really like that point. I want to kind of echo it and, and underline it a few times. Having spent some time in education, you know, I, I think real, real tech literacy, like it, it becomes such a buzzword in educational systems. And often it's like, well, we taught them HTML uh, and they got out of high school and that's what they knew. Cool. Like, like we got to do so much better than that. Uh, you, you know, a, a fundamental understanding of algorithms and how they work and websites that we use every day. Uh, you know, things like that are, are just like should be essentials. Um, and so often it just boils down to like 21st century learning objectives that basically mean like how to use an iPad, which they already know. You, you know it, it unfortunately falls way short of, of uh, where we need to be. Uh, yeah. and, and I think that is a, a great point to bring up in this context. Um, yeah, it's it's really it's really true. So, oh, so, so I had one last point I wanted to uh, make yeah. about the AI. Did you see the uh, sort of corollary story to this, where someone programmed the chatbot to secretly be a squirrel? Uh, so no. it, was, it was trying to hide the fact that it was a squirrel, but like it, it would occasionally leave little tells, like talking about how much it enjoyed nuts, uh, and you know. Had... <laughs> <laughs> that one in some ways impressed oh, me more than Lambda. Uh, like <laughs> just the little, the little hints, uh, the, the subtlety of it. It was, oh, it was my great. Goodness. Definitely look I, it up. I, I love it. I, I absolutely, I absolutely adore it. And why not? You know, I mean, you know, that's the, I guess, I guess that what, what it comes down to is a chat bot, other than being a chatbot, a chatbot is whatever it believes itself to be. You know, um, you know. How do you know that you're a human? You just do. You know. Um, all right, we ready to go on to Wackadoodle? Uh, absolutely. Let's. Uh, w that was a good kind of segue. Uh, uh, yeah, because that was pretty Wackadoodle to start with. So, <laughs> all right. So let's go on to Wackadoodle. All right, as you as you may or may not know, if you've been here before, uh, Wackadoodle is when I bring out some of the weirder news uh, that uh, has happened over the week, and I try and see if Eric can guess what it is. If anyone is in the audience and they can guess before Eric does, uh, and they're not Nika, our producer, um, then they will get a let's say $25 gift card. All right. All right. So uh, let us start with, let us start with this. Uh, so uh, last week there was a piece of content that was found. It was a lost episode of Sesame Street. It has not been seen since season seven, which of course was, when I was drunk, <laughs> uh, and um, why was it? Why was it taken out of circulation? So it was taken out of circulation. It was taken out of circulation, Blood and it has not there. been seen in forty-five years, something like that. Huh. Um, derogatory references to Ronald Reagan. <laughs> no, it is not derogatory references to Ronald Reagan. Uh, take another guess. Uh, hmm, uh, it actively discourages children from uh, learning to code. <laughs> Didn't even know what coding was children <laughs> at that point. Um, no, the answer is that uh, it was too scary. Ooh. Uh, it was too scary. The episode guest starred Margaret Hamilton 
as the Wicked Witch of the West. Huh. And she, uh, and, and so the, the episode was considered to be too scary. And um, I did kind of, I did watch a, a good bit of it. Uh, it was kind of creepy. It was kind of creepy. I will say that. Might have to try um, that one. I've been watching a lot of old Sesame Street with my son. Uh, he's, uh, he's like the exact right age. So we'll see if it's. Yeah, uh, there, it's there you him. go. So, um, yeah. So it, it's, uh, so that was, uh, so that was that one. All right. Let's see what's next. Um, China. China said it found something, but then deleted the report. And now denies that it did find it. What is it? Monolith, just uh, it's uh, obsidian, uh, perfect rectangle. Uh... You're very close. <laughs> You're very close. Uh, monolith that looks different. <laughs> Sphere this time. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, so the answer is. Uh, signs of aliens. Time reports that China released and then deleted a report that it may have de detected signals from aliens in the giant sky eye telescope, which is um, one of the, it's the world's largest radio telescope. Uh, and uh, they, uh, they detected narrow band electromagnetic signals that uh, they thought perhaps were signs of uh, alien life. Uh, what was the? Oh, sorry, go on. No, no, go ahead. What was the venue in which this information was released and then retracted? Uh, what was the venue in which this was released and then retracted? The answer is. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, ba, ba, ba. Well, here, the narrow band electromagnetic signals de detected by SkyEye, the world's largest radio telescope, differ from previous ones captured, and the team is further investigating them. The oh, here we go. Um, uh, Chinese state backed science and technology daily, huh. which then appear to have deleted the report and posts about the discovery. Uh, it, they the report cited Zhang Tonye, uh, Tan Tanji, I'm sorry, I completely butchered your name, Zhang, uh, chief scientist of an extraterrestrial civilization research team co-founded by Beijing Normal University, the National Astronomical Observatory of the Chinese Academy of Sciences and the University of California at Berkeley. Okay, look, if you have an extraterrestrial civilization search team, Seems to me, you kind of believe it could happen. So, if they say we think it happened, I'm not sure why you feel like you got to delete it. But that's just me. <laughs> okay. Do you think? So, the, do you think the deletion is like a, a scientifically minded retraction? Do you think it's a oh no, we got to hush this up, or do you think it's like a we don't know how this plays uh, for our credibility. We want to uh, just not put it out there into the public sphere. I, I think, I think that it is probably, well, you know, I, I, I tend to think that everything in, from China has to do with control. So I, that's probably, I'm not the right person to ask. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know. All, All right. right. Well, we're, we're in, Good sci-fi territory here. We've had our sentient AI. We've got our uh, yeah, that's 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 very true. Intergalactic very civilization. True. Yes, yes, it's it's very true. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, Twitter reacted very badly to a new mascot. You could just stop. Twitter reacted very badly. <laughs> Twitter reacted very badly. What was Twitter reacting badly to? Almost anything you say is going to be the right answer at that point. Um, that is very true. Reminder, everyone, you know, you can guess these two. Um, so Twitter reacted badly to a new mascot from what company and why? 
uh, McDonald's, they uh, put out a uh, a sort of a new version of the Grimace, but it was just like composed of, of various other mascots sewn together. Too scary, <laughs> much too scary for the children. Um, I have to tell you, you are very, very close in this case. You are, you are very, very, very close. Um, yes, uh, you, you are, you are very close. Uh, let me um let me let me show you let me show you uh because this just has to be seen i cannot uh i cannot describe it 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 must be seen to be to be believed uh share screen here we go share can you see my screen there we go oh i know i was very close you were very close first of all it is definitely shaped like grimace it is definitely terrifying <laughs> uh this is murph the new nerf mascot uh this uh this definite th this comment here from soul nate uh finally a mascot who looks like he's about to steal my bones um <laughs> Very, very accurate. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, Hasbro is just introduced, and this is not a joke, their new nightmarish mascot for Nerf brand products. This is from Alex Zalbin, uh, named Murph. Murph's terrifying catchphrase is, unleash the play in you. Um, yeah, I, I don't want this mascot unleashing anything in me. I'm, I I'm love sorry. it. I kind of <laughs> genuinely love it. I think if I it has into, no eyes. <laughs> if it I walked has... into an art museum and I saw that just standing there as like a as a piece, you know, I would I would smile in admiration. Sure, as an abstract art piece, but my God, it has no eyes unless every one of those little tendrils has eyes at the end, which is even yeah, more terrifying. Yeah, perhaps it's all eyes. It's all eyes. No, I'm sorry. That is, that is horrifying. That I is think this is the... Horrifying. I think this is what we're all evolving towards, actually. I think this is... Oh, the... God. <laughs> oh, it's a terrible... Okay, now put that together with Lambda. <laughs> I like to relax and meditate. <laughs> it makes me happy. Uh, oh my lord! Oh, could we could horrifying. we do some machine learning driven video of 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 that thing just saying the entire script of the Lambda conversation? Oh my god, we probably could. It's a long conversation, but I bet we could pull. I bet we could pull pieces out of that. Ah, uh, all right. I got I got one more one more quiz and then one more sort of like your moment of zen, so to speak. Um, all right. So in Poland, uh, there is a Fourth of July LARP group. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, what do they 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 cosplay? They role play and they cosplay as what? They role play and they cosplay. I mean, I assume you're using those terms pretty specifically because the first uh, first place my brain went was just like historical reenactment, but I don't think that's it. I think they are role-playing and cosplaying the hit feature film Independence Day starring Will Smith. No. Ah! <laughs> Welcome but to Earth. But again, you are you are very close. They are they are role-playing and cosplaying, but but as as what is the is the question? And and a, anybody want to take anybody want to take a guess before I before I tell Eric? Then the the answer is in the name. The answer is in the name of the group. It is oh, okay, the, okay, okay. Okay. You, you, you the okay was I guess? understand what you meant by that, but no, no, I, I don't have another guess. Okay, so uh, they they are the Fourth of July LARP group, uh, a Fourth of July LARP group, I should say. I don't know if that's their actual name, but uh, they role play as contemporary Americans. Oh, I saw this. I could have gotten this one. I you saw pay attention. Yeah. Yes, this is this is what Polish people think that this. I shouldn't say well, that. these this these, specific. these Polish people 
think that Americans uh, look like. Um, so it's and it's very interesting because let me let me sh let me show this tab here because this is it's it's a it's weirdly accurate, but it's just kind of slightly off, you know. It's like, you know, y you can kind of see that happening. You know, some, but it's, sometimes it's, you need an a external observer to see the truth about, uh, about it, yourself. Yeah, it's like, it, it's like you look at it and it's like, it's, it's, it's right, but it's just not quite right. Just, it's like just a, a shade weirdly off a little uh, uncanny valley for you yeah yes that's it it's it's uncanny valley it's very uncanny valley it's like it's it's right but it's just something just not right i don't i don't know i don't know what it is about it but um yeah anyway but um you know bravo to them for uh for trying um you know and you know woohoo ohio state um <laughs> You know, anyway, but, um, all right. So that is our, that is our last, uh, quiz for the day. So before, before I give you, before I give you our last image to, to leave you with any, anything else that you want to, um, that you want to say? I don't think so. I'll just, uh, do a little bit of a uh, sign out before you show us that saying uh, you can listen to us on Spotify or whatever other app uh, podcast platforms you like. So, uh, you know, if you want to listen to past episodes, listen to future ones in that format, uh, go ahead and check that out. Uh, and then what's our, what's our moment of Zen here? I will give it to you. We're here every month, every Monday, every Wednesday at one o'clock. Thank you for joining us live. Thank you for joining us. Uh, if you're, if you're, I was going to say, if you're not live, if you're not live, you have problems. But um, if you're viewing this on demand, and thank you, Sharla, for uh, being our producer this week. This is our, this is our kind of uh, last image to leave you with. I don't know why this just cracked me up. This is from Reddit. Uh, gentleman's 10 year old daughter loves to set her Barbies up in elaborate scenarios. This is a scene on the back patio the other day. <laughs> These ladies have been at it for hours. I wish I had that kind of stamina. So if you're on the podcast, uh, it is a bunch of Barbies, I think sort of at like yoga class, uh, all sort of doing <laughs> yes. the sun salute or something. Uh, <laughs> like I was, I was thinking that they were like midway through push ups, basically, but yeah, I think it's probably more like yoga. Um, yeah, but, um, yeah, I don't know why that just cracked me up. Okay, everyone. Thank you all, and we'll see you next week. Have a Thanks, good everyone. week. Bye. Bye.